I'm going to talk about the Atlanta urban ecology framework, and I'll explain what that means in a minute. I come from a firm called Biohabitats, and we do uh, conservation planning and ecological restoration and regenerative design work throughout the country. And as, as um, I guess Jim mentioned earlier when he said, where are you located? I said, Charleston, right? So does anybody know what this is? Speaking about biophilia. It's a beach. Porpoise. So it's a dolphin. So there's a difference between dolphins and porpoises, right? So this is a bottlenose dolphin. Does anybody know what this bottlenose dolphin is doing? This bottlenose dolphin is feeding on fish. So this bottlenose dolphin, what it does is it, it um, with a couple other of its mates, goes up there and beaches itself up onto the mud flat in the marsh. And the other dolphins out here swim around and push the fish up to this dolphin. And this dolphin lays always on their right sides, never on their left sides and feeds on the fish that are being pushed up to them, and then they switch turns and do this. And what's amazing about this, uh, even though that's, you know, that's amazing in and of itself, but what's really amazing about this is that there's only two populations of bottlenose dolphins in the world that exhibit this behavior. And one is in Charleston, South Carolina, in the low country of South Carolina, mainly from about Savannah up to maybe Myrtle Beach. And the other one is actually there's a population in New Zealand that does this. And the scientists, we still haven't figured out why these populations of dolphins have learned this behavior. And even um, dolphins that are right next door practically don't, don't exhibit this behavior at all. It's not how they feed. So it just goes to show you in terms of, you know, when we talk about biophilic design and we talk about biodiversity, that even within species, there are certain uh, uh, behaviors that these animals exhibit that are really, you know, beyond um, value in terms of what, what they can provide. Uh, what, what another factor that's happening with these bottlenose dolphins is uh, some of the chemicals, some of the chemicals that we use for no-stick fry pans and for cosmetics and for hand cleanser and for uh, uh, fire retardants are getting into the water now. And scientists are finding elevated rates of these chemicals in these bottlenose dolphins. There's been an extensive study done in Charleston of these dolphins. And you've all heard the term canary in a coal mine, right? When the canary begins to die, not enough oxygen, coal miners need to get out. Well, now they're basically saying that these dolphins are becoming the canaries in these estuaries because they're beginning to bioaccumulate that chemical into them and they're finding deformities and uh, um, diseases, more susceptible to diseases in these dolphins. And so they're you know, a, a, a great animal, um, but we're beginning to see signs of distress just from the chemicals that we use every day that we don't really even think about, right? So um, when, we, when we think about biophilic design and biophilia, you know, if we think about it from a biocentric standpoint instead of an anthropocentric standpoint, then we begin thinking about, you know, what are these animals exhibiting? What are they experiencing? And how can we design better to make sure that we're not interrupting their sort of evolutionary potential out there? So, uh, so we have been involved, or we got recently involved with a... Uh, um, program with the city of Atlanta. The city of Atlanta recently, and, and Stephanie Stuckey earlier alluded to this, um, Tim Keene, the commissioner of planning for the city of Atlanta, uh, basically a couple years ago said, you know, Atlanta's going to start growing, or they're going to continue growing, and they're going to add about 40% more population to the city than what exists now in the next 20 to 30 years, which is huge if you think about that. And he said, you know, we, we have a choice. We can either just let it go haphazardly or we can begin thinking about how can design play a part in how we grow in the future. And so he commissioned his staff and a team to go out and put together what they call city design. And you can look that up on the web. It's a, a pretty powerful 
um, planning document that really is basically, if we're gonna grow um, and add that much population in the future, how do we wanna make that happen? And they kind of went back and thought about Atlanta and thought about what makes Atlanta unique from a cultural standpoint, right? And Dr. Martin Luther King, and basically came up with the idea that Atlanta is a beloved community. And they want to, in, in their eyes and in the public eyes, there's a lot of public input into this, how can Atlanta become a beloved community going forward and maintain that? Um, and so they began looking at, well, you know, not changing is not an option. Atlanta is gonna change over time. So the people that always say, we wanna keep it the same, you know, we don't want things to change, that's not an option. We need to change, so how are we gonna do that? What's the most strategic scenario for growth that includes everyone in the city? And basically what they did is they came up with these five sort of guiding principles here. Number one, equity. Number two, progress, ambition, access, and nature. So nature being one of the five, they said, we want to make sure that nature is infused in whatever we do and however we grow into the future here. Um, so we're going to design for people, we're going to design for nature, and we're going to design for people in nature. And that's the whole theme of city design going forward. How can they design for people? for the city of Atlanta, how can they design for nature to make sure that nature is integrated into everything that they do, and then how can they design for people in nature? So in terms of nature, they looked at how can we design for wildness? How can we reincorporate, either, either conserve the wildness that exists in Atlanta now, or how can we enhance and reincorporate or integrate wildness back into the city of Atlanta? The other thing is, how can we design for retreat and adventure? Again, that's putting you know, people in nature. How do we experience that wildness in there? And how do we make sure that that's part of our growth plans going forward? And then design for connections. So the idea of connections is connections for people. It's connections for wildlife. It's connections for ecological slow, flows and connectivity. And how can, how can we look at the growth of the city of Atlanta in the future and design for these connections? And so their approach more or less comes up with these sort of two blueprints here. One on the left shows the growth areas. And if you look at those growth areas, they're really these fingers that come out from the center of Atlanta. And they follow transit. They follow um, ridge lines. They file, follow historic growth patterns. So they said, you know what? Instead of just continuing to sprawl, which Atlanta is, you know, the capital of sprawl in the United States, if you think about it, we really want to focus growth back into the core of the city, and then take these ridge lines, these spines that are coming out, and that's where we really want to concentrate growth in the future, because that's going to be more efficient from a transportation standpoint. It's going to collect people there. And then on the right, we've got all this other space. Not that there isn't growth in that space or not that there isn't people in that space, but that's the space we really want to say, OK, that's where we're going to really reconnect with nature and protect what's valuable from a, from a natural um, asset standpoint. So there's other cities that are doing this, right? There are other cities across the, United, uh, across the world that are incorporating this idea of uh, biodiversity, of green networks. A lot of the cities in the United States are doing this. Um, Barcelona, um, you know, that's, if you've ever been to Barcelona, it's a pretty dense urban core in Barcelona. And basically their whole dot idea here is they need to invent space for forest in Barcelona. They recognize how important it is. And so they figure out, well, we can't really get rid of the density. It's what makes Barcelona so fun and exciting place to be in terms of all the buildings and the urban plazas and everything else, but we really need to reinvent how we bring the forest back into those urban areas, right? In Hamburg, they, you know, Hamburg is um, really centered around a lot of water and they're looking at climate change and they wanna make sure that whatever they come up with in terms of their green network and bringing ecology back into Hamburg, it takes climate change into account. And so they're really, they've really focused a lot on their green network and looking at urban ecology from a climate change perspective. 
San Francisco um, uh, spent a lot of time taking the whole concept of landscape ecology, where you're looking at forest, you're looking at corridors and patches and matrix, and they looked at it from an urban perspective and said, well, from an urban perspective, how can we uh, reestablish corridors and patches, not only for people, but for wildlife, and how can we reconnect all that back up into, this, into the city? So they spent a good deal of time looking at wildlife connections in and through uh, the city of San Francisco. And then Edmonton. Um, I think we heard a little bit about Edmonton yesterday, right? The whole idea. Um, I, I mean, I love the, the name of this, Breathe, right? That's Edmonton's Green Network Strategy. Um, and, you know, the idea that it's really supporting each neighborhood, that these neighborhoods are all connected through their whole green network there. And it's multifunctional. There's a lot of what we call ecosystem services that they're looking at and building upon um, to create this. So we also know that over the years, especially over the last 20 years, there's been an awful lot of work in urban ecology, um, not only in the United States, but around the world. In fact, um, there's the Baltimore Ecosystem Study now that's been going on for well over 20 years. Um, Phoenix has an ecosystem study um, uh, com research component too. There's now been a lot of books written on urban ecology. And there's, there's science beginning to be developed now, a lot of good peer-reviewed research science in urban ecology. And it's how can we take that science and really apply it back to how we develop cities how we plan for cities, and how cities will grow in the future. Right, so we're looking at everything from, you know, human ecosystem frameworks to ecosystem services to feedback models to looking at socio-ecological systems to looking at urban meta metabolism, ecological urbanism. There's a whole bunch of different sort of subfields of urban ecology that are forming now. And um, it's, getting, it's, it's getting really exciting, but it's also getting pretty complex when we start looking at all this. But there's a lot of really good, rich, rich thought and rich research going into the whole idea of urban ecology. So how would you like to live in that neighborhood? Do you think you can find your way home? <laughs> so, so this kind of reminds me of Atlanta, right? Um, sort of the urban sprawl here. And it reminds me of uh, a time I was in, um, well, actually a friend of mine was in Ireland, not myself, and he needed directions to go someplace. And if ever, you've ever been in Ireland, you know that when you're in those little tiny roads and the stone walls and you can't really see, you're not sure. And he stopped along the way and a guy was walking down the road and he said, you know, I need to get to such and such. And the guy turned around and he said, well, I wouldn't start from here if I were you. <laughs> Right? And when I, think about, when I think about urban ecology and I think about planning for cities in the future in terms of ecology, it's almost like, well, I wouldn't start from here if I were me, right? I would rather be starting from some other place, but unfortunately, we are starting where we are and, and moving forward. So uh, what happened with that city design was uh, the outgrowth of the city design and what the uh, Commissioner Keene said was, okay, we've got a design for sort of development pattern and growth in the future. What we need it, it, as part of this three-legged stool is we need a transportation plan, right? A mobility plan, really, not just transportation, but how do people move around? Um, much, you know, uh, where cars aren't the, the major factor. And then the third leg of the stool is ecology. Um, Commissioner Keene said, you know, ecology has to be part of this three-legged stool in order um, for Atlanta to grow the way we want it to grow. So they put out a uh, RFP about a year ago or a year and a half ago that said we want to bring on a team that's going to look at how we develop an urban ecology framework for Atlanta going forward, right? And the purpose of this is to really establish a natural context for Atlanta's growth and development and determine what aspects of nature in Atlanta should be preserved, restored, or accentuated by the public realm. Um, a pretty big task, right? And so Commissioner Keene's whole idea was, let's go beyond just coming up with a green network. Let's go beyond just coming up with uh, uh, ideas about 
resiliency and climate change. Let's go beyond just talking about ecosystem services. Let's go beyond just talking about parks and open space. Let's do all of that together. Let's come up with a comprehensive holistic framework of urban ecology and how we infuse that back into the city going forward. So the idea behind this is really what, what makes Atlanta, what's the essence of Atlanta? Right? Every landscape has, is, it's a unique place in, in this whole planet. And sometimes we obliterate that uniqueness of, of where we are and we begin to lose sense of where we are. But Atlanta is unique, just like every other place on the planet. And so how do we bring that essence of that uniqueness back up so we can celebrate that here in Atlanta and make that sort of the core of how this urban ecology framework goes forward? So we came up with three ideas in terms of the approach for this. One, it needs to be science driven. Imagine that in this day and age. But it also needs to be um, married with place based, right? It again, this uniqueness of place here. And so what is the science telling us? But what is this place telling us from not only a, a science standpoint, but from a cultural standpoint, a historic standpoint, an ecological standpoint, a geological standpoint, a climate standpoint? So we really need to look at that. What gives this place, what, what, what is the sense of this place and how do we celebrate it? Which is really important in terms of looking forward. So we can come up with a lot of great ideas or techniques, but if it doesn't speak to the essence of what Atlanta is, it, all that is is just ideas and techniques. And um, you know, we need to think about the stewardship of this going forward. The second one is it needs to be really richly layered and intricately connected, right? What we like to call a riot of reciprocity, that everything is feeding into one another. And when we talk about resilience, this is resiliency, right? A riot of reciprocity. That everything is, is, is feeding into what, no, what, one another, it's teeming with life, it's all interwoven. The whole fabric of how people interact with the city and how nature is embedded in a city is all woven as one. So there's no, you know, when you go into the city of Atlanta in the future, there's not this green space is over here and nature exists over here and it doesn't exist over there, right? We want that boundary to disappear. And then the third is it needs to be inclusive. Everybody needs to be a part of this. It needs to speak to everybody in Atlanta regardless of who they are. It needs to be literate and it needs to be adaptive. Right? It's going to change. The minute we get finished with the framework, things are going to change. And this framework needs to embed that sort of adaptive, adaptiveness in there. I don't know if you um, know of the landscape architect, uh, Randy Hester. He taught out at UC Berkeley for many, many years. He's retired and he lives in North Carolina now. Um, but he was a big proponent of this idea of ecological democracy, right? That every, every, not only everybody, but every species gets a voice, right? And what happens? Um, and how do, we, how do we bring that to the table here? Um, so, you know, imagine every neighborhood in the city with free and un unencumbered access to quality green space. People can name 10 different species of native trees where decisions regarding the implementation of the framework are accomplished through an inclusive, transparent, and participatory process, and that's what we call ecological democracy. So those are sort of the three tenets moving forward, right? It's place-based, it's richly layered and, and connected, and it's inclusive, literate, and adaptive as we move forward. So then we started thinking about the whole idea of scale, right? And the city just isn't isolated by itself. It is obviously connected to the regional landscape and, in other areas, so we thought of this idea of nested scales, right? So this ecology framework is going to be looking at the regional place where Atlanta sits, the um, Piedmont Forest in the Piedmont, uh, southern Piedmont. We're going to be looking at the city itself, and then what you can't see off the page there is neighborhoods, right? Like many cities, Atlanta is, is rich in a lot of different neighborhoods whether it's the urban core or whether it's the surrounding neighborhoods throughout the city, this ecological framework has to speak at each one of these scales in order to be effective, right? So there'll be things happening on a regional, regional scale, flows and energies and systems that come in and out of Atlanta, things are gonna be happening on a city scale and things are gonna be happening on a neighborhood scale and this framework has to speak to all three of them. This is just a sort of cartoon sketch. The red outline is the city of Atlanta. 
and thinking about that scale, looking at the Chattahoochee River, which flows down the left, South Park, which we heard about from the Nature Conservancy the other day, down on the bottom right corner, and just sort of an abstract look at where are there already parks, where are there green spaces, where are these connections flowing in and out of and around the city of Atlanta, and how do we take advantage of them from an ecological perspective. Right. So we came up with, I think, six, six different components of this. The first is biodiversity and habitat. Um, so we're going to be looking at biodiversity throughout the city on those three nested scales. Uh, and we're going to be looking at habitat, right? So everything from rare, threatened, and endangered species to species, migratory species, um, to resident species, aquatic, terrestrial, and even like kudzu down there on the bottom, um, invasive species, right? And the problems with some of these invasive species that are coming in and how do they affect um, this ecological component. So biodiversity and habitat is one thing. One of the things we try to do is actually um, come up with a list of focal or target species um, as sort of our canaries in the coal mine to basically say if, if we're developing an ecological framework, are there certain species that repre represent certain guilds that if we are able to provide habitat for those species, then we provide habitat for a lot of other species that um, use that similar habitat. So that's one of the things we try to do in all the design work that we do. We're not just saying we're creating habitat or, or green space and putting it on the side. It's what is that habitat or green space? Who's it for? and who's going to be using it, and will it become a genetic sink over time, or will it actually have connections in and out um, to provide uh, the, uh, um, for that wildlife to prosper in there. So we're going to be looking at things like um, land cover and land use, and there's already been some mapping done on a state level uh, on species richness, and you can see Atlanta up there in the brown area, which has one of the lowest um, uh, numbers of species in that region there just because of how the landscape has been so altered and developed over time. But this gives us important context to begin thinking about this. And then the whole idea of ecological connections, um, our second component here. How is the city of Atlanta ecologically connected to not only within the city but also to the region? So everything from air sheds to water sheds to nutrient flows to habitat corridors and patches. Um, how is the city of Atlanta um, connected to its region? So the whole idea of fragmentation has had a huge impact um, on species and the habitat of species, and that's happened all over the world. In the eastern United States, we've lost what we call these interior dwelling, um, or these interior forests and species that only um, inhabit interior forests. And so we're creating all these edges all over the place, um, and we're losing some of the interior species in these areas. So as we begin to fragment the landscape more and more and more, we begin isolating species, and it's this whole what they call island um, biogeography effect of uh, beginning to lose not only the population, but the genetic diversity in species here. So we need to be looking at that. Um, this is just taking a really big step back. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the Wildlands Network, but they're a national organization that looks at trying, they're, they're looking at trying to reconnect um, court wildlife corridors on a continental scale, um, really over all of North America. But this was a, 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 a modeling exercise that was done to look at if you dropped a, a, a species on, on the, in the United States like a cougar or a wolf, what's the least resistant path it would take to get from one point to another? So in other words, what habitat's available for it to use to move through the landscape? And they used a whole bunch of different species and a whole bunch of different, different model iterations. And what you see there is the red lines or the yellow lines are where in theory, species could move from one place to another, right? Um, based on the least resistance from landscape. Um, and you can see the whole middle of the country there, the reason that's empty, why do you think that's empty? Farms. Farms, right, agriculture, completely taken over there, right, right? But you can see on the Appalachian Trail, the orange in the east, you can see the Rockies and the um, parts of the Sierra Nevada, 
and some of the, a lot of the BLM land out west and um, lots of room there still to roam, um, even, even going up through uh, the boundary waters and, and some parts of the Great Lakes up through there. But what's really interesting from, um, it, you know, in Georgia, if we start taking a look at Georgia here and Atlanta sitting right here, that it's not too far from some of these major corridors that could one day maybe see wolves return there or other top predators or carnivores um, that would be really great from a, a biodiversity and wildlife standpoint. So again, kind of stepping back and thinking about that big picture there. And in fact, there's a, a movement underway right now called the Eastern Wild Way, where they're looking at now looking at trying to conserve and preserve and restore an eastern wild, lay, wild way that would provide that kind of habitat for these um, top predators that we've lost in the landscape that, have, that are causing all kinds of, you know, cas trophic, what they call trophic cascades or ecological um, impacts through there. So it's just interesting to think about. So when we start looking at Georgia and we start looking at the ecoregions in Georgia, we start looking at the watersheds, we start looking at where Atlanta is, again, what's the connection back to the city and how can not only that can, how can the city reinforce that connection, but how can the surrounding re landscape reinforce the connection back into the city there. So this whole idea of landscape ecology, except on, you know, taking, taking the idea of landscape ecology when you're looking at patterns like patches and corridors and the matrix and edges and interiors, and you're looking at all these ecological processes that happen, how can you take that and then apply it in an urban setting? And that's something that we're, we will be looking at and applying for the city of Atlanta. And then, you know, there's even, even examples like this of what kinds of widths, corridor widths do you need or ranges you need, patch sizes you need for certain species, right? So if we think about, um, Stephanie mentioned today Proctor Creek and the Proctor Creek Greenway or the Beltline or um, uh, Peachtree Creek, there's a lot in, in Chattahoochee River, there's a lot of areas in the city that still have a riparian zone on that. So if we look at what kinds of species, what kinds of biodiversity we want, how can we begin planning for certain species to make sure they have the right, the, the right habitat, the right ranges, the right corridors, the right patches, that type of thing, right? Um, so again, it goes back to this sort of idea of how do we put that overlay on top of Atlanta and begin thinking about it from a regional scale. And then, you know, what Matt talked about earlier today, the whole idea of ecosystem services. What ecosystem services here do we really want to highlight? I mean, we really want to highlight all of these in this ecological framework, right? But <clears throat> we're only going to be able to really concentrate on maybe a half a dozen of these to really bring them forward. That's not to say that they wouldn't be embedded in a lot of other things that we do, but we're taking a hard look at what data is already out there um, what can we use to begin selecting and highlighting what ecosystem services we really focus on for the ecological framework here? Um, and trees, right? Trees are the one, biggest, one of the biggest assets for the city of Atlanta. It has the highest density canopy of tree cover of any city in the United States. That's, and one reason is because it's so sprawled out. <laughs> Right? But there's a lot of neighborhoods in and around Atlanta that have kept their tree canopy cover, um, which is fantastic. It's great. It's a huge asset. You talk about ecosystem services, all the different ecosystem services that trees, just trees alone provide is pretty amazing. Right? So one of the big things we're really going to be focusing on is trees. And um, how can we, how can we you know, have a city in the forest? Or how can we have a forest in the city? How can we have both of those together? So trees is going to be a huge focus, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. The next area is environmental justice. You know, we couldn't do an ecological framework without thinking about environmental justice. We have lot, and again, as we saw earlier today, lots of land, or maybe that was yesterday, landfills and um, pollution and water quality issues. Um, and uh, point source pollution in terms of both water pollution and air pollution, uh, brownfield sites, contaminated sites. Um, how do we, and then access, access to green space. Um, where is there the density of green space and open space for people to use? The quality of that space. 
how do we begin looking at all those issues and incorporating that into the ecological framework? So we're going to be looking at the data that EPA's come up with. We're going to be looking at climate justice issues, right? As the climate begins to change in the Piedmont here, who's that going to most affect? And how are those, those um, uh, uh, populations going to be able to deal with climate change? Uh, you know, the whole redlining, right? This is a, actually a map of Baltimore and the redlining that, that took place back in the um, you know, 20s, 30s, 40s that really segregated a lot of Baltimore, which happened in Atlanta too. Um, in fact, we're working in um, San Francisco right now and uh, we're working in, in North Richmond and basically a lot of African Americans were brought out to San Francisco to help build a lot of the ships for World War II. And basically what happened after that is um, all the housing was pushed in and all the low areas around San Francisco Bay were filled. Um, the marshes were filled and that's where housing was put and that's where a lot of the African Americans were um, you know, pushed into that area because of um, uh, loan practices and because of real estate practices. And, Many of the communities now in those areas um, are suffering from an economic standpoint right now. And so we see that happening. We've seen that happening. That legacy is, is still with us today and in some cases still happening. So how do we deal with that legacy issue there? And how do we get you know, all sorts of populations of people um, and, and elderly and young people involved in this whole ecological framework is going to be really key to all this. So the whole sort of environmental and social justice issues needs to play a, a large role there. In fact, we did a study for Baltimore County, uh, Baltimore County, Maryland, and they were putting a lot of money into reforestation and stream restoration and water quality improvements from stormwater, but they never really looked at um, a study of environmental justice issues. In other words, what communities were at risk in this case related to water quality and found that most of their money was going to communities that weren't at risk. They were going to communities that were more privileged, right? And so we were able to look, we were able to turn their heads around and say, look, you're putting all this public money into all this, these types of work, but you're not putting it in the right place. Um, these are the communities that are most at risk. That's where your money should be put and that's where most of your projects should be put. So taking that kind of lens and looking at issues like health, in this case, from a, a water quality perspective. And then open space and parks. You know, this is the Beltline. Um, for, you know, for, you, for many of you that may be out of town and haven't been on the Beltline, it's a wonderful idea. It's taking old railroad uh, right-of-ways that uh, surrounded the city of Atlanta and they're turning them into greenways now and creating this, you know, I don't know, was it 24 mile loop around the city of Atlanta. Fantastic, it's doing great things. Um, it's also gentrifying a lot of these areas now um, because the, the land prices are going up because of um, how popular the Beltline is. But who has access to the Beltline, right? Who has access to open spaces and parks? How do we, are, is there enough open space and parks um, in the city of Atlanta? How does that feed into this whole ecological framework? And there's a lot of open spaces that we don't even think about in terms, you know, if we're not using them, but wildlife might be, or in terms of ecosystem services. So we have open spaces and vacant lots. You know, we have uh, neighborhood open spaces. We have streetscapes. We even have, you know, median strips and right-of-way strips on a lot of the highways. And all of these could be really ecologically rich if we begin thinking of them in those terms and begin thinking of them in terms of supporting biodiversity and habitat and ecosystem services. So we're going to be looking at all these spaces throughout Atlanta to determine how can they feed into and play a role in this ecological framework. And then finally, resiliency, right? So climate change, the big one. Um, how is climate change going to affect the city of Atlanta? Is that going to bring along more disease, um, more pests? Uh, what's going to happen in terms of rainfall? What's going to happen in terms of how does ecology, how, how do species and habitat evolve over the next 50 years with climate change? And we're going to see shifts there, right? Here, this is just a model of looking at the shifts in, in um, uh, forest over the eastern United States that may happen over the next 50 years. 
or so because of climate change. And if you look at Georgia over there on the right of where it is today and the different types of forests that might be there in the future, well, we need to begin thinking about that now um, in terms of this ecological framework and what is that going to really mean to biodiversity and species in this area and what migrations are we going to see begin to happen because of that. Um, and then I'm going to go back to trees because trees is a big focus here. And as Stephanie also mentioned this, uh, this afternoon, that the city of Atlanta has a tree ordinance. It's been around now for 20, 25 years, maybe even a little bit longer. Uh, but what's, what's happened now is because land prices have gotten um, so high that it's much cheaper and inexpensive for a developer to come in and take the trees out and pay the penalty than to keep the trees. So there's no mechanism. There's no mechanism that says you have to keep trees. There's a mechanism that says if you're going to get rid of these trees, you have to pay in to this um, fund. And so right now, with land prices going up, it's like a no-brainer for a lot of these developers um, to go in and do that. Plus, a lot of people are buying lots. A home, uh, individual lots, and they want to expand the footprint of the house, you know, go from a 900, uh, 1500 square foot house to a 5,000 square foot house. And so they're taking a lot of trees in these older neighborhoods out in order to accommodate a bigger footprint for their house. So one of the things that we're charged with doing is once we come up with the ecological framework, we're charged with going back and looking at the tree ordinance in Atlanta and saying, how do we re rewrite this tree ordinance? to support the idea of this whole ecological framework we came up with, right? So it, had, it, it can be nested within that whole framework, so there's rhyme and reason for what we're doing. It's not just a tree ordinance. It becomes, in fact, Commissioner Keene said, why don't we make it an ecological ordinance or a nature ordinance that incorporates much more than just trees? And we begin looking at other things, whether it's biodiversity or ecosystem services or or streams, or water, or soils, healthy soils. Let's come up with a nature ordinance instead of just a tree ordinance. So he's really pushing us and pushing those kinds of ideas there. We're going to be spending the next six months going through and thinking about a tree slash nature ordinance that would support that. So some of the things that will be coming out of this, I mean, we're, doing a, we're going to be doing a lot of data collection, GIS analysis, looking at all these, you know, developing all the models, doing all the sort of typical overlays and coming up with all the maps, and then coming up with policy recommendations. So the whole idea is that this framework would begin to feed into the rezoning process that Atlanta is going through right now, begin feeding into their comprehensive planning process, and even begin to think about how do you begin changing development regulations to support this ecological framework here. Um, so we will set up the framework to do all this. We're not going to be doing all that. Um, that would be the next iteration after the framework is done and some of these sort of higher level policy recommendations are made. And then it's going to be up to others to come in and fill in those details and begin negotiating that, right? So, you know, the hot, whole idea is that just like some of the other cities that you saw earlier, it's taken a combination of all that and embedding that back into the city and how does the city, how does Atlanta want to become the beloved community in a way that supports nature and people and people in nature. And so that's the whole idea behind that. Um, and then, as I said before, coming up with the, the tree ordinance there in terms of protecting the trees. This, this is kind of funny. This is a, um, these are goats out here and they're taking care of the invasive species problem in a site. Um, in fact, there's, there's a, a business now in Atlanta where you can rent out these goats to come in and, and take out the invasive species. Of course, they take out every other species in there too, so you need to be careful about that. But that picture on the right is actually Proctor Creek, again, the, the project that Stephanie Stuckey talk, talked about earlier today, and that's right in the middle of Atlanta, right? That's beautiful. I mean, it, there's, there's a abandoned car down a little bit further around the bend. But I mean, there's some actually beautiful places that really speak to what, you know, what Atlanta look, used to look like and what it can become in terms of the city. And that's the whole idea of sense of place and, and sort of spirit of place. And even thinking about the more urban sections of Atlanta in terms of street trees, right? What about 
and, and we're doing this in other areas, what about a mixture of native understory and overstory trees that you're recreating a forest corridor down a street? So not only is it a street for people to move through in and out, but it's a street for biodiversity, for habitat, for migratory songbirds, for you know, a whole microcosm of habitat that exists in that canopy layer in there. So that's how we begin to connect these green spaces throughout Atlanta, that we use these urban areas as a way to um, create movement. If they can create movement for people and cars, we can certainly create movement for species there. And if you think about green walls and green roofs and how that can add to that whole, whole, whole um, component there, then you're really talking about creating a city for, for pollinators and for all, all kinds of species to move in and out and through the city. Um, in Baltimore, we just finished this idea of a green network. We did a green network plan for Baltimore. And Baltimore, like many sort of northeast um, industrial cities, has a lot of vacant land right now. And so the whole idea is there is how can we repurpose that vacant land, at least temporarily, right? And, and just like Detroit's looking at, hopefully that's all temporary because we really want to concentrate urban development back into the city. But in the meantime, how can you repurpose it for ecological function and ecosystem services that as you begin to um, grow back out that city, it's all combined and integrated in um, to your future growth plans there. And just finally, you know, we were talking today, um, I threw this in at the last minute because we're, we all experience these streams that in urban areas that downcut like this, right? And we've even seen some around here. They're all over the place. We, we run into them all the time where you get a lot of storm water that runs off all the impervious surface. It begins to cut the channel down. It overwinds the channel. All that sediment goes down through. And we talked about carbon today and how to put carbon back into the soil and how to think about ecosystem services. And so some of the ideas we've been coming up with is to mimic beaver dams, right? Beavers had a huge influence on the landscape throughout, throughout North America here. And, um, if you think about some of our streams and rivers now, in fact, a lot of people have said that at one point we didn't have really single thread streams and rivers. They were all these threaded floodplain, um, uh, you know, on top the floodplain with wetlands and very rarely did we have a single thread of stream running through the landscape. So that's pretty amazing to think about that from that standpoint. And so we started thinking about, well, how do we begin to mimic those beaver dams in a way that still provides stability from all those urban flows that come through, but how can we do that? Adding uh, wood chips and organic material in here to add carbon back into the soil and back into the water column here and create these sort of, uh, uh, you know, using sort of the idea of biomimicry, right? Uh, maybe this is ecological mimicry here to create these. And this is the kind of ecosystem you end up with. So it's all going from that ditch to this where you're bringing the water back up on the surface, you're providing all this habitat, it's acting from a stormwater standpoint in terms of, of managing the quantity and quality of water through there, and you provide all this great habitat, and it's in an urban area. And so you can do these sorts of things in urban areas to really, again, promote all, that, all those ecological services, the, bringing the carbon back into the soil, um, providing these, uh, providing stormwater management and a whole host of uh, biodiversity through there. And in fact, these pitcher plants, were, which weren't planted there, um, uh, all of a sudden be, uh, reemerged because all the seed, they were in the seed bank for maybe 50, 60, 100 years, right? And they begin reemerging, all these plants begin reemerging in here. So it's pretty fascinating how nature will come back if you recreate these right conditions through here. And then even we began looking at you know, looking, this is discharge of the amount of water going through and comparing that to a stream that's not restored. And the red spike is those streams that have really flashy flows that after it rains, all the water goes down in the stream and it goes through really fast. And the, the blue there is the stream, the stream I just showed you that was restored. And so it got rid of that flashy um, uh, spike in there and the water just slowly goes through that floodplain. It recharges the groundwater. It, it doesn't erode downstream through there, right? And the same thing when you begin looking at temperature, water temperature, it lowers the water temperature in the restored reach. 
And it begins also removing a lot of the pollutants, whether they're suspended solids or phosphorus or phosphate and nitrogen, it really begins to remove that. So if we back all this up, again, with the science and the monitoring, we can actually demonstrate that using these kinds of ecological systems can do this. And this is what's really neat. This project costs $750,000 to do, but when you apply, sort of when you begin to monetize the ecosystem services that it, it, it's providing, it's providing 4.6 acres of, of wetland restored, which has a value of $803,000, 2,000 linear feet of stream restored, 300,000, three acres of forest restored, 225,000, and 200,000 cubic feet of flood attenuation that you would have had to build $2 million. So for a cost of $750,000, you're getting an ecosystem benefit of over $3 million in there, right? So we talk about how do we kind of show the policymakers and the developers and others the economics of all this. Well, you know, we can begin looking at ways of of doing that to show that we are really enhancing the ecological services of the area. So finally, I'll just leave you with this, right? Um, our, many of, our, uh, of us, um, E.O. E. Wilson is a hero. You know, he's come up with this idea of half Earth we've, we, that we've got to basically preserve half of the terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems in the world in order to preserve biodiversity. And I love this quote here because we all talk about climate change all the time, but very rarely is anybody talking about the loss of biodiversity out there, right? And that's permanent. I mean, once species go, they go. They're not coming back. We might be able to get the temperature back down, or we might be able to somehow get carbon out of the air, but we can never, ever, ever get species back once they're gone, once they become extinct. And so really the idea of thinking about, well, yeah, climate change is leading to species extinction, um, but just as much so as habitat fragmentation in the way that we're sort of managing and treating the landscape. So if we can really put our attention back to species, which I think is all about biophilia and biophilic design, then I think we're going to solve all those other problems too, right? So thank you.